The scripture reading is taken from Matthew 9, 9 through to 17. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does a teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast? but your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The day will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins and so both are preserved. Cycle number two of three in Matthew chapter eight to nine. You know the deal by now. Three sets of stories. Each of them have three miracle stories, followed by a reflection on discipleship. And so we looked at the three miracle stories in story cycle number two last week, which were three truly epic miracle stories, right? They really were, I mean, the calming of the storm, the releasing of the men oppressed by demons and the healing of the paralytic just blew our minds. And so we're prepared for this reflection on discipleship to be equally mind-blowing, right? It will be, okay, so it, it, it will be. I was trying to set that up for you all just to say a truly epic reflection on discipleship in the story. I don't know if you remember the reflection on discipleship from story cycle number one. That was two interactions with would-be disciples uh, with Jesus, um, and you remember the reflection on the foxes have holes and birds of nests, but son of man, all of that. And so that reflection on discipleship titled that sermon with a familiar phrase, the cost of discipleship. And we spoke about the fact that there's a cost in following Jesus. Well, now, end of story cycle number two, as we reflect on discipleship, there are again two stories this time, not with two individuals, but two groups of people who, have, who are acquainted with discipleship. And so that's the Pharisees on the one hand, and then John the Baptist's disciples on the other hand. So another, another two accounts. But this time, different to the first time, we're not talking about the cost of discipleship. Have that in the back of your minds. This time, however, we are talking about the joy of discipleship. How does that sound? Sounds a little more appealing, right, when we speak about the cost of discipleship, and that is absolutely what these two stories are about. So let's get into it. So the first interaction uh, is with, um, it's actually the call of of a special person. And so the story starts out with a very clear discipleship cue, the words, follow me. And so by now we know in Matthew, uh, follow me, it has a discipleship cue to it. Remember, follow me into the boat, etc. So it's a very clear, we're in discipleship segment. It's also very clear that this is going to be a story of celebration. So let's just look at that first part again, verse 9. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, to Matthew that is, follow me and he Matthew, rose and followed Jesus. Isn't this amazing? Lo and behold, 20-something weeks into the series, we finally get to meet the guy who's written this account. How awesome, 
Round of applause for the introduction of Matthew finally making it into the scene. This has been, uh, you didn't really have to applaud at that, but it's just the idea of like, hey, it's finally the guy that we've been nerd crushing on all this time. At least I speak for myself. Uh, but here we have on the scene, Matthew, the one you believe has written this account. That's been the view of the church since the, the first 50 years of the church. I believe it is this Matthew. That's why it's called the gospel according to Matthew. And so, I mean, I just love this moment that we finally get to meet this guy. And so let's reflect a little bit on, on Matthew, on his story. So what do we know about Matthew from the Scriptures? It turns out we know very little. There's not much written uh, about Matthew in either of the Gospels. He is not recorded in any Gospel as saying anything. He doesn't say a word. Seemed like he has a certain word quota, and he kept that for writing this Gospel account. Right? Just like I have a certain quota of words that I use on a given day, and so Sunday when I get home, I have nothing to say because I've used my word quota in saying sermons all the time. But Matthew says, uh, all day on Sunday, Matthew says nothing. So we don't have a record of, of anything that he said. What do we know about Matthew? There's one thing that we know absolutely about Matthew, and that is his occupation. He is a tax collector. Right, and we can see that in the fact that this person called Matthew is sitting at a tax booth, and so we can deduce that he is someone sitting there to collect taxes. And if we had to jump ahead in the story, that would become very explicit. So in chapter 10, where there's a record of the two the 12 disciples are, that's just before the, the second big discourse, which is the missionary discourse as Jesus sends them out. So we have a list of the 12 disciples, and here Matthew makes sure we know this about him. So verse 2 to 4, the names of the 12 apostles Apostles are these first Simon, who's called Peter. Uh, so he was Simon, now he's Peter. Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee. John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon, the zealot. And Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So notice that there's, there's not a lot of information in that list about these 12 people. I mean, there's some, some of them, we are told their family relationships. This is so-and-so's brother. This is so-and-so's son. We told something about Judas, right, that he will betray Jesus. But for two of the guys, we are given a little bit of extra information. For Matthew, we're told he is a tax collector. And with Simon, we're told that he's a zealot. And it's just really interesting that Matthew would put that detail about himself as a tax collector and Simon as a zealot together. But that's a story for another day when we get to Matthew chapter 10. But for now, note that Matthew, the fact that he is a tax collector is highlighted here. He, he very specifically wants us to know, and in the call of, of him, it, there's the hint there as well. He wants us to know that this is an important part of the story that he is a tax collector. So let's see why. I'm sure most of you know this, but let's dig into it a little bit so you can see just like how radical this story really is. So as the title suggests, I mean, tax collector is a lot of what tax collectors do today, and that is to gather taxes, uh, that is on property, that is on income, but that is also on import and exports. So kind of like if you had an airport and you're coming back from a trip to the States like we did recently, normally you used to back in the day go through customs and you had to declare that this watch uh, didn't come in, you know, and you get taxed on what you bring in. And so that's kind of like what was happening at the time. So Matthew is sitting at a tax booth at the intersection of a major road and collecting taxes on goods coming in and out of the area. So that's what he does. Doesn't sound too bad, does it? However, the tax collectors in that time were people who had been enlisted by the Roman government. So just remember that, keep that in your mind. The territory that these gospels are taking place in is under Roman rule. The land of Israel is under Roman rule. Most Jewish people did not like the fact that they were ruled by Romans. The Romans were quite oppressive. And so tax collectors were collecting money on behalf of the Romans. And, and, and mostly the tax collectors were Jewish people. So just picture this. These are Jewish people who are collecting collecting money from fellow Jews in order to fund their oppression, okay? So that's just generally the sentiments towards them is not going to go uh, really well. These guys are working for the ones who are oppressing them, taking their money to assist them in, in their oppression. On top of that, tax collectors were, were notorious for extorting people for money. So they weren't paid by the Roman government to collect taxes. They were just allowed to charge extra 
on top of what they were supposed to give to Rome and use that to fund their own lifestyles. And there were some guidelines as to how much extra, but we know that they just broke those guidelines and used the Roman soldiers standing nearby to extort literally more money. And, And we know these kinds of things. We're not embellishing these details. If you're reading Luke's gospel, there's a lot of information about tax collectors. For example, when John the Baptist is baptizing people and there's this question of signs of repentance, like what does it look like in real life to have repented? And John says, for tax collectors, don't charge more than you're authorized to charge because it turns out that's what they would do. So if you put this all together, I mean, you're a, a Jewish person living and he has this tax collector who's part of your people yet collecting funds and extorting you on behalf of the oppressors. I mean, it's just, you can picture in your minds that a tax collector would be not liked, to put it lightly. You with me? And so they were hated actually by the Jewish community and so excluded from Jewish community. They would not be invited to parties, to any kind of festivals. They, they weren't in, allowed into the synagogue. So that's a place of worship and, and a place of prayer and then they weren't allowed in the synagogue. They were also considered by the rabbis at the time, so this is not in scripture, but rabbinical teaching said that tax collectors were considered ritually impure. Uh, impure because of their association with the Gentiles, the Roman oppressors, they're literally being in business with them. And so they were considered impure. And so you would be considered impure if you went into a tax collector's house. Because if you know how ritual impurity works, it's like if you touch something that somebody else touched that's impure, then you become I- impure. As so you go to their house, like you're going to walk on the floor, you're going to become impure. So you would not be allowed into their house, which meant as well that tax collectors not only were not allowed in the synagogues, but getting into the temple as a place of worship was really, really difficult for them. And so you just got to imagine all of this is going on in the background. And now you have a story of Jesus, who is a Jew in the mold of a rabbi. What I mean by that is he's collecting followers like like rabbis do. Jesus, a Jew in the mold of a rabbi, a Jewish teacher comes to Matthew, a tax collector and says, you follow me. And you just have to imagine in your mind that 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 sentence is supposed to be mind-blowing. Now, I know, maybe if your mind's not blown, that's okay. Don't feel guilty. Could be because you've been reading Matthew really carefully. So well done. Because in Matthew, we've already been introduced to this as a strong theme in Matthew, right? that no one is excluded, right? Everyone gets to be part of of what Jesus is doing. So if that's in your mind, like that's great. But a tax collector really is a symbol of a person who is hated, who is considered an outcast, and I mean, for good reason. And there's a lot of negativity towards them. And so, I mean, a tax collector as well, those guys too, yes, they also get to be disciples, They also get to be formed part of this new community that Jesus is building, the the fellowship of these 12 disciples together. I mean, it's incredible to us. It's cause for, like, if you look at the story, you go, wow. I mean, if Matthew can get in, like anyone get in there. And you you got to think in your mind, man, how excited must Matthew have been? Like, how awesome would this day have been For him, for after years of being given the cold shoulder and treated and pushed to the margins to be invited in and be part of this community, you would think like that's cause for celebration, right? Right? And it is. And that's exactly what Matthew does. So he throws a party. That's what you read in verse 10. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and we're reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And so Matthew's understating things a little bit in how he writes this account. He's shy, he doesn't want attention on himself. Luke writes that this is Matthew's house. Luke tells us it's his house. And he's a tax collector and he, so he's wealthy. They just really all were. And so he's got this big house. And Luke tells us that it's a feast. Matthew goes reclining at table. But like even Luke tells him, no, no, this is a feast. You need to see this. This is a party. It's a party and the guests Matthew has invited, the only people that he's associated with, that he's allowed to associate with, which are other tax collectors and other notorious 
I mean, I mean, sinners, people with shady reputations that have also been pushed to the margins. That's the only people that he could associate with. So that's who he invites to this party. And the guest of honor is Jesus and his disciples are present and they are having a whale of a time together celebrating what has happened in Matthew's life. Isn't that cool? I actually, I, I, I'm going to do a lot of speculation this morning, okay? If you thought last week was me going on imaginative journeys, there was nothing. But I like to think of this celebration as like Matthew's farewell party, well, you know, with his tax collector buddies. And this is like, you know, they're losing him as a colleague, but he's going to follow Jesus. And they're all like celebrating. This is his farewell party. But you've got to just look at the story and see the celebration going on here. This is, this is what we're speaking about today the joy of discipleship. I mean, I was going to say just right up from the beginning, I mean, even in doing this at o'clock, just realized I, I, I try to pack too much in. I'm going to try not to make the same mistake here. But just to realize that there's so much in both of these stories that we're not going to get to. And I'm going to say that that's okay because what I, do, I don't want us to miss the biggest theme here, which is the joy of discipleship. The fact that there is a celebration because of what's happened in Matthew's life that he was, he was living a certain way and now he gets called by Jesus. And yes, there's a cost. The cost thing is there. He leaves behind the profession of tax collecting. He's not going to be wealthy anymore. So there's a cost to discipleship, but on top of the cost is this gift and this joy. And we're meant to see that the joy outweighs the cost with plenty of spare change. Right, and it's celebrating and, and, and having this, having this party. I, I mentioned that there's this gift uh, of discipleship and, and I meant that intentionally because Matthew's name, you know names have meanings? So the name Matthew means, guess what? It means gift of God, gift of God. I mean, even there, I mean, we talk a lot about names. I mean, you shall call his name Jesus for your Savior's be from their sins. So, gift of God. Matthew has received a gift, like an incredible gift to be called by Jesus to come out from the margins and from being hated into this new community where there's love. And I mean, I just, I just have to include this. I said we did it in chapter 10. But the fact that Matthew and Simon the Zealot are together so Zealots was an extreme sect within Jewish society that basically were terrorists who were trying to overthrow the Roman government through guerrilla warfare. So they would assassinate Roman officials and assassinate people in allegiance with Rome, including tax collectors. Literally, Simon would have gladly murdered Matthew before. And that's why Matthew writes both of them, hey, he's a zealot and I'm a tax collector. Like we should not ordinarily be in the same community together, but now we are absolutely like on the same team. I mean, it's just, it's beautiful. It's a gift that is taking place here. Matthew, gift of God. But it's not just that Matthew has received this gift, the sense of dignity all of a sudden, uh, the sense of, of new purpose and, and a new community. He's, it's a gift of God. He's received a gift, but he also becomes a gift of God. Just think about that in his name. Right, gift of God. He receives, we look at Matthew's life and go, man, he received a gift from God but he also became gift of God by becoming the person who would, who would edit, edit this account, right? I, I have this other speculation in my mind. It's not just me. Many people think this, and there's good reason for it we'll get to one day. But I mean, I, I want to pause today and just enjoy the story of Matthew. So let me let you in on what, what could be happening here. So there is a theory. I'll hold to this theory that Matthew, as, as we know him, I mean, a tax collector, but as a gospel writer, that Matthew is in fact a scribe. So we've met scribes before. We know who they are. They're like super smart people who have been trained from a very young age and who are, who are editing like, scripture and, and compiling scripture. So there's a theory that Matthew's a scribe and that really comes to light in chapter 13. So do wait till we get there before we really flesh this theory out. But Part of the deep, part, it, it fits the pattern. We know Matthew in writing, like he knows his Old Testament, yes, like only a scribe word. 
Like his attention to detail, the way he's organised his material, very scribe-like. There's another data point in here, though, that helps with this whole scribe idea. And that's that, so his name's Matthew, but actually that's not his real name. Or it's not the name he was ordinarily called. If you read Mark and Luke's account of the calling of Matthew, it says that Jesus came past a tax booth and called a man named Levi. That's right, Levi. And so Levi, so probably this is an instance of someone whose name gets changed, which is not unfamiliar territory in the list of the 12 disciples. We already have that. This is uh, Peter, whose name was Simon. And you know, there's a lot of meaning in why the name was changed. And so maybe Matthew is a guy who's received this name change. That gift of God is very, very deliberate by Jesus that this is who you will be. You will be a gift of God to my people. You've received this gift of God. But his previous name was was Levi, but it may not have been his actual name. That might be a reference to the fact that Matthew was from the tribe of Levi. Now, the significance of that is if you're tracking with the scribe theory, which I am along with, uh, that trace the scribes, trace their origin story back to Ezra. Ezra who returns, uh, you know, Nehemiah, that whole story to rebuild the temple. Ezra is the origin, is the prototype of the scribe. And Ezra was a Levite, from the tribe of Levi. It's so just another data pointer. And if you put this together and church, this is speculation, but I'm, I'm doing it deliberately today. I, I think it's reasonable speculation, but if you put that all together, what you maybe have here is a story of a guy named Matthew or Levi, who is a scribe and from a young age is taught the scriptures and knows the scriptures and has his trajectory, which is a very noble trajectory set before him but along the way somehow leaves that behind and becomes a tax collector, turns on his people, starts to extort his people, leaves behind what was a very noble, godly calling to go this way. And then all of a sudden Jesus walks by his tax booth and says, follow me. And all of a sudden Matthew ends up with Jesus and now is the gift of God, like more in line with what God had originally intended for Matthew to do. How's that for a story? I mean, it's a, it's, it's a reasonable story. And I think part of what has been so awesome for me this week in preparing this story is just thinking of my own story of conversion. And I just, I want you guys today, that's why we probably won't get to the detail. I know a lot of you want to be, what's the new one? Okay, we're not going to get to that today. But I really want us to, this is a, this is a day to ponder on how Jesus calls people to become his followers how that is a huge interruption and a disruption in their life, but how it's a gift, how it's a cause for celebration. And I think of just my own, my own journey, which I don't think I've even shared from the pulpit. I will not share too much, but I, I grew up from a very young age going to church. It was a tiny little Methodist church near the plots in, out in Walkerville, tiny, tiny. Uh, and my mom was like a Sunday school teacher there. And so we were introduced to Christianity. So through primary school, I just was going to Sunday school, going to Friday night youth, youth, the whole deal. Uh, through high school, obviously resting a lot as people do, but, but I remember trying really hard to still be a Christian. But I went to university and that's when things went another way, as often happens in the university space. I mean, again, I was still like, I hadn't apostatized, uh, but certainly I wasn't living my life. I knew I wasn't living my life in the way a Christian should live. And it was just like, like a, t- a, t- a terrific time and uh, uh, terrific in a, in a bad way, right? I'm just you know, p- departing from, but it, there were, okay, anyway, maybe, maybe Freudian slip, Freudian slip. But like along the way, final year university, it came this sense, my, my moment, and our stories are all very different. But this was my follow me story moment where I was on a youth theater retreat thing, a kind youth pastor had seen something in me and said, hey man, you need, you need to come. And I was listening, uh, and someone in the room actually was, was even there at the time this beautiful story happened, and just really realized, man, I had the trajectory I was on, which was so great to just left that behind and living another worldly way and just like you know, heading in the wrong direction. And this was just a call to, to come back. And coupled with that was this idea of, of being in ministry. And so for me, just all that to say this week, this story has been so personal for me of like just reflecting on what Jesus does in a human life. And it's different for everybody. And that's my story. And this was Matthew's story. But ultimately, all of our stories follow this in some way. 
where there's lostness, there's a going our own way that was leading off a cliff to destruction as mine was very close to like just a different life that would have been really horrible. Our story is there's a lostness and a heading a certain way and an interruption by Jesus just coming and a, a call to now orient our lives his way. And it is a huge interruption and disruption. There's a, a leaving behind, like a sacrifice. There's stuff, there was a lot of pain at that moment. But if I look back from now, I look back and I, I, I don't look back with any regret. It was a gift. It was a gift. This is what salvation is. Lost, called to follow Jesus, given a new identity. Maybe not a new like literal name, but you know what I mean? Like a new sense of self-worth, a new sense of significance, like a new sense of purpose, a new sense of security, of like a, of a new belonging to a new community of people. Right, that's what's happening in the story. That's what happens in every single conversion story. And so I want to say to you today, church, I mean, for those who've been a Christian for a while, this is just a good week to reflect on that story. I really encourage you to do that. But for the few, and maybe it's just two, or maybe one, or maybe it's just one person, for those who have not yet actually fully decided, you know, I mean, I doubt Jesus is going to walk in physical form and say actual words to you. It's through these stories that we reflect on the fact that he calls all of us even the most unlikeliest of people, those who would never consider themselves worthy of being a Christian. Like there's no way Jesus would call me. Well, you read the story of Matthew and you know that that can't be true. As the most unlikely person to be included in his kingdom community. And I wanna urge you, if you have not yet decided, make that the day because I mean, you have such a phenomenal example in Matthew. And if you're still like wondering about whether like, actually me, you don't know me. You know, you hear my story and think, okay, so you try to be a good Christian. I mean, I haven't indulged the other stuff, but you think not me, like I'm too far of a, of a sinner. Well, let's get to the next part of the story. So there's, there's, a part of, there's a party happening. They're celebrating with Matthew. Guys, don't miss that. Man, it's a party. It's just, it's a party. But dun, 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 into the Pharisees, right? Mood killers. And so they come along and they're just grumbling, you know, like, how is it that you are hanging out, Jesus, with tax collectors and sinners? And again, let's just reflect on that. Like this just disturbed people's sense of what religion meant. Religion meant keeping yourself pure, which means distancing yourself from people of ill repute and tax collectors and just see this is Jesus hanging out with them. And yes, to the Pharisees, it's scandalous. But again, church, this is just marvelous that this is Jesus. Right? He's not coming for those who have their lives together, you know, who've got it all and present their case before him. Look, see how amazing I am. Like he's coming for those who ultimately know that they need him, that they need a savior, which is really the whole point of what he says next. So they grumble about this because they can't make connections. And I, just side note, but important side note, just think about as Christians how we stay away from interacting with people, who we think our children should hang out with, etc. I'm just posing these as questions because Jesus comes in really for the Pharisees. It's just they can't compute. They don't have a category for a rabbi being in the same house as these disreputable people. But there he is. And so he responds to them. But when he heard this grumbling, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, of a doctor. But those who are sick do have need. Go and learn what this means. So he's talking to the Pharisees here who are learned people. And when Jesus says, go learn, like that's insulting. But he's saying, go learn what this means. Now he's quoting the Old Testament. They should know the Old Testament, but Jesus is going, no, you don't. Go learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. It's a quote from Hosea chapter six. For I came, now I just want you to again to hear this amidst all of the detail and there's so much awesome, glorious detail, but today's not a day for that. Like today's a day for just not missing 
the wood for the trees. For I came, Jesus says. Now that's a statement of intent. Like we're speaking about calling and purpose. And so let's not miss his self-understanding of the particular reason that he came from heaven and took on flesh. I came not to call the righteous, those who believe they have everything all tied up and correct. I didn't come for them. I came to call the righteous, but I came to call sinners. That's who he's come for is sinners. And again, I think just for me, what's going through my mind is I'm adding lots of personal stories and information here. But when I was flying back from the States, now recently, uh, I was on a plane, I was watching that movie, The Jesus Revolution. I don't know if anybody's watched that movie. It came out earlier this year. It was on mainstream cinema and was a, you know, I'd heard about it, but I hadn't watched it. So I'm coming on the plane. Um, I'm without Kristen and the kids. They had stayed longer. So I'm on my own. It's like late at night. And I don't know if I'm just really tired or sad because I left my family. But I was watching the movie and getting really emotional about it. And uh, decided, no, we're going to watch this. We went on a staff retreat and, and watched the movie as well. And it's, it's, there is actually this really moving story of the true account of a revival within the hippie community back in the 60s, 70s, whenever that was. Just like these true stories of people who never believed they would be accepted in the church, but through one guy, it's just true story, get accepted in the church whose lives are radically changed and become disciples of Jesus. And in fact, I was... Um, we're commenting on this with, with Lee Robinson. You know, Lee, my predecessor at Rosebank, I saw him on Friday, was telling him about the movie. And he said he was actually in, in Canada at the time at a Bible college that was receiving a lot of people who had been converted under this revival. And he was just remarking on just how solid this was. And the movie's so great in that aspect of people who feel like they would never belong in a church, people who feel like and were criticized by the religious elite, but those are the people that Jesus welcomes and who radically changes their lives. Sinners. And just right off to say, like that, the, the purpose of this is, it's not that Jesus came only for sinners, he came for people who know they're sinners. And that's the purpose of the whole healthy and sick and doctor analogy here. I mean, don't, don't make the mistake here. It's not that in the world. I mean, they say that in the world, there are two types of people. Those that say they're two types of people and those that don't say this to them. <laughs> Jerry, we do look at the world as like two categories, right? And so don't think here that what Jesus is saying is that in the world, there are righteous, healthy people. They exist. They actually don't need any help. They're actually, amazingly, they're perfectly righteous. But on the other hand, are people who are not righteous and, and they go to the doctor, I've, I've come for them. No, it's the ones who know that they are sinners who acknowledge their need. If you don't believe you're sick, you won't go to a doctor. Why would you do that? And even if you're sick, maybe you self-delude yourself that you're not sick, you don't go to the doctor. But those who realize there's something fundamentally wrong will go get help. And Jesus is saying that those who don't believe there's something wrong, who think that they're righteous, who think that they're good with God or good in the world, will never respond to His call, will never go to Him. But those like tax collectors and sinners and those who have been marginalized, those who've never believed they're worthy enough, that when Jesus comes to them and goes, you, I want you, oh my gosh, they will give their lives and follow him and, and have them completely changed. And so it's not that the world is, there's righteous and there's sinners. If you want to compartmentalize the world into two groups of people, it's not righteous and sinners, it's there's sinners and then there are sinners saved by grace and called by Jesus to follow him, right? Those are the only two categories. We as Christians here today do not fall into a category of some spiritual elite. We're the sinners too, but we're the ones who by grace have been, God has reached down and invited us and called us into His community and we celebrate that. Amen? And you can see this, that this is where Jesus is going when He interacts with the Pharisees and He quotes Hosea 6. And what we should do if I could preach for three hours, what we should do is we would go to Hosea 6 and really study Hosea 6, but I'm already like three minutes, almost out of time. So we're not gonna go into Hosea 6, but what you need to know about Hosea is it's a classic Old Testament prophetic book 
which really is saying, repent your Israel, repent your lives are heading towards destruction, idolatry, etc. You need to come back or there's going to be judgment. It's classic. But what's unique, or maybe not unique, but what's a clear theme in Hosea is actually the religious leaders are targeted. Okay, so that's important. Hosea, for example, 5 verse 1 says, Hear this, O priests, pay attention, house of Israel, so leaders of Israel. Give ear, O house of the king, for the judgment is for you. So there's a very clear focus on the leaders. And so you can see he's targeting the Pharisees here who were also sinners. They just didn't know it because they had the structures of religion in place. And that's what Hosea 6 verse 6 means. Here's here's the quote in the Old Testament. For I desire steadfast love, the Lord says. When you read in the Bible, God says, this is what I want. You'd be like, okay, like let me take my pen. This is what God wants. Let me pay attention. For I desire, says God, steadfast love. This is that beautiful Old Testament word, chesed. Covenant, faithful love. It's it's a sense of loyalty and duty, like with a spouse, where there's things that you do because you've covenanted with them, but it's not empty. It's fueled by affection and love. That's the love. God's saying, that's what I want. It's not that he doesn't want the sacrifices and the systems that he prescribed. It's the fact that the religious leaders then and the Pharisees in Jesus' time were practicing them, but their hearts were far from him. There was no covenant affection. And so he's targeting them, saying, you too are in danger. You too, leaders, need to see you're sick. And the reason I'm pointing that out is because as we're reflecting this morning on tax collectors and sinners who hear the call, but they, in, in some sense, it's easier because they know they need help. But the harder group are the Pharisees that Jesus challenges all the time who don't think they need help, who've got their structures in place, which is probably a lot more Christians today. As I speak to this audience, we are likely more in that category than we are in the tax collector sinner category. And sometimes, I just, that's all I want you to think about this morning is which of the two are you? the tax collector sinner who gets called or the Pharisee who's equally called but with a stronger nudge because of how hard-hearted they were. Sometimes we, we're both at different stages in our life. You start off here and then it ends up your religion becomes empty. My heart for this morning and this passage for most of us in the room, my heart is that those who aren't following Jesus come to Jesus. But my heart is also for those who've perhaps been a Christian for a while in the words of Psalm 51 that we'll pray later, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Restore that, that we continue to follow Jesus in the practices and the things he's taught us, but motivated by joy and affection for him, which by the way is what the next story is about, which I absolutely am not going to get into in detail. John the Baptist's disciples come to Jesus and go, hey, how come your disciples don't fast? Right? Because in their minds, holiness meant you know, religious practices, For the Pharisees, holiness meant abstaining from people who were sinners, and for John's disciples, these religious practices. And I mean, I'm not going to go into new wine or all of that. What I want you to see is that when Jesus answers them, he doesn't say, I mean, it's not about fasting, this passage. right? Don't take from this passage, all fasting is, is, is bad. I mean, actually what was happening at the time is we know that the Pharisees and likely John the Baptist's disciples fasted regularly twice a week. That was Jewish custom at the time. We know this because Luke 18, Jesus tells a parable about a Pharisee who stands up in a temple, self-righteous, look at me, I'm not like the tax collector. It says, I fast twice a week. So they fasted twice a week. But what you need to know is that in the law of Moses, like in our Old Testament scriptures, fasting is only prescribed once a year on the Day of Atonement, those of you who don't want to fast are like, oh, praise the Lord. I'm... <laughs> on the Day of Atonement. And so if you want to get into the fasting argument here, well, what was going on here is that John's disciples and the Pharisees, I mean, it's fine to fast more, like twice a week, there's something wrong with fasting per se, but they were going way above God's law, which was, I mean, one thing, but the worst part was imposing that on other people as though that's what religious practice looks like. And Jesus comes to free them from that kind of religious straight jacketing that they had self-imposed, which is what I think the new one means. Like there's a lot more freedom 
in being a Christ follower, there's a lot more celebrating. There's a lot more joy. And sure, there are moments where we will do fasting, but in appropriate ways. So this is not really about fasting. What it is about, what Jesus latches onto is that one fast the day of the year. That's why you need to know that. The day of atonement. Because the fasting then was, was very deliberately connected to the day of atonement. And the day of atonement was the one day in the year where the priest you know, had to cleanse himself through animal sacrifice and then, and then there was an animal sacrifice made to atone, to cleanse the sins of all Israel. And so it was right, it was appropriate that you fasted on that day because it was a symbol of contrition, of repentance, of a sense of grieving literally over my sinfulness. And so you would fast at the day of atonement and then celebrate that your sins had been atoned for. So fasting was connected with grieving and mourning. And so when the disciples asked Jesus, why don't your disciples fast? Essentially, he's connecting with that idea. He's going, whoa, hang on. Why would there be grieving when I'm around. Because when I'm around, it's occasion for partying, not grieving. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he says. He said, really, he says, if the bridegroom is present, him, bridegroom, I mean, through scripture, he's the one who's going to return as the bridegroom and the church is bride and there'll be a wedding feast. This is all what we believe. So he says, if I'm the bridegroom, I'm around like the groomsmen are not grieving for me. They're happy. Everyone's excited. Everybody knows it's appropriate at a wedding to rejoice, yes? At a funeral, it's different. It's appropriate to grieve. It would be inappropriate if you rejoiced at a funeral. It would be inappropriate if you're really sad, like that grieving that this person's getting married. And so again, actually what this story is about is again the joy of discipleship. When I'm around, we're not grieving. We're celebrating. There's joy. And then he says those words. He says that they will fast. When the bridegroom's taken away, they'll fast. And if there's one thing that I think is important to get right, it's, it's that sense. So, I mean, when, when was the bridegroom taken away? Him, Jesus. When was he taken away? So his death, the resurrection, then he was back. So that was cool. But then the ascension, sort of back into heaven, taken away. And so presumably that means that now there is this mourning state, that it's appropriate to mourn. And we can connect with that quite easily, right? We see the evils in the world around us. We know that we're still committing sins, and so there's an appropriate mourning. But there's also, we have to wrestle with Matthew that Jesus says, like, when I'm around, it's celebrating. When I'm gone, yes, appropriate to mourn. When I'm around, it's celebrating. And yes, he's gone, but is he gone? Is he gone? Or is there a sense in which he's still present in at least some way? It is the latter because, I mean, I know we're jumping ahead here, but the very last words of Jesus in Matthew, okay? So last words, those are important. What is the very last thing Jesus says in Matthew? He says, and lo, or behold, he says, take note. I am with you even to the end of the age. So yes, there's a moment, the end of the age, when he will come back in final, full physical form. But even prior to that, after his death and resurrection and Pentecost and the Spirit coming and all the charismatics are like, yeah, new one, that's what that is. And cool, yeah, because he is present with us now in some way. And so there is a sense in which discipleship now is rejoicing. And to be sure, it's not all rejoicing. Just last week, we looked at a story of being called to get on a boat in the middle of a storm. That happens. But it's not all just storms and demons and giving up your way of life and extra religious rituals and more maintaining purity by staying away from ungodly people in the world. It's not just all self-pitying. It's a gift. And it's appropriate as Christians to celebrate. Now, amidst the grief, yes, one day when he comes, no more grief. And it is a party. It's a Matthew party times a million. It's feasting. It's well-aged wine. It's just beautiful, etc. So don't make the mistake now of thinking that this following Jesus thing is all just the bad stuff. Man, this is, these stories are about the joy of discipleship and the joy of salvation. And perhaps some of us have lost that need to recover that. Amen? So let me pray for that. Let's pray.
In church, before I, I pray myself, just as your heads are bowed and eyes are closed or however it is you, you pray and feel comfortable in a prayerful state, just I do think it's appropriate this morning, since we have some time, to just reflect a little bit. As I've reflected this week on my own story and your story being so different, and if you've walked with Jesus for a long time, I'm just I'm sure that as has been with me and with just everyone who's been a Christian and walked with Jesus a long time, that that joy of salvation sometimes fades away. We forget just the gift of being called to follow Jesus. And this, this account in Matthew 9 this morning is absolutely a reminder of the gift gift of God. And so maybe reflect and remember what your life was like, where it was heading, the circumstances around Jesus' interruption of your life, the newness that he gave you, the new identity, the dignity, self-worth, and assurance, a community, a purpose. And to be sure, I'm, I'm sure that if you've walked with Jesus for a while, there's been many storms and many, a lot of grieving because, yeah, this is the world we live in now. But through it all and through the persecutions and even through the difficult issues and circumstances as we reflected on last week, should be this background at least of the joy and privilege of being called by Jesus to be his followers, to be citizens of his kingdom, to be reinstated as sons and daughters. And so perhaps for those who've even considering not following Jesus anymore, don't do that. Hear him say to you as well, follow me. Some, perhaps some of you need to hear that anew. Maybe some of you like me, it, it, had been, it was there and then it was in the background. And now this morning is the real call to step up into a renewed vision of being a follower of Jesus, perhaps with new responsibilities, perhaps with huge change, maybe. Or maybe there's somebody out there, or a few even, never truly made this decision to follow Jesus. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back. Still considering and, and just, Thank you for being here and considering and being open. But may you hear not my words, but Jesus' words, follow me. There's nobody that he would exclude. Lord, we confess that we, we the difficulties of life and in being a disciple, um, as we have learned and I will learn in even greater detail just how tough this gets, just that that has robbed us of the joy of salvation and the joy of following you. We confess that and repent of our self-pitying attitudes sometimes and forget the dignity, the gift of your calling. And so restore to us the joy of your salvation. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Restore to us the joy of your salvation, we pray. May that anchor us and hold us with the joy that is before us, that day when you do return as the bridegroom coming for his bride. Us, your church, have been faithfully waiting and faithfully persevering clinging on to this hope of fullness of joy, zero mourning and grieving. 
may we be anchored in that hope and that joy until that day you come, Lord Jesus. Amen.